Uh, Dr. Chol Kim here from San Diego. I suspect you already know I'm the host. Uh, I'm a spine surgeon and um, I have with me a special guest, Dr. Stephen Darrington. He's a doctor of osteopathic medicine. He's board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. He did his residency training at Thomas Jefferson University, which is in Philadelphia, but it happens to be one of the premier spine programs in the country. And then he has all kinds of fellowship training in advanced pain medicine, including regenerative medicine. Um, he's got all these letters after his name that I don't even know of, uh, which means that he has lots of extra training. He knows a lot about uh, cutting edge, state-of-the-art uh, treatments for uh, back pain and pain elsewhere. Uh, he has also background in osteopathic medicine, one up on the medical doctors because they have to learn everything we know, plus they have to know about osteopathic medicine. And I suspect you already know, I'm a big believer in regenerative medicine, alternative medicine, um, as well as the hardcore medical medicine. So we're gonna hear about him. Let me start out with a short presentation, which will hopefully kind of lay the groundwork for some questions that I would like to ask Dr. Darrington, a few questions. And at the same time, we'll also start pulling in questions from all the attendees through the chat box, and we can even call some people up. So. Um, Get your fingers warmed up with the chat feature, and I hope that this will be very interactive. I don't want to have a lot of lectures. I want to answer as many questions as possible. And it's really focusing on the latest, greatest state-of-the-art non-fusion treatments for back pain. So let me start out with a brief kind of PowerPoint talk that will uh, kind of lay the foundation for why, why we're talking about this. So. Um, once again, I'm Dr. Chol Kim. I'm a spine surgeon uh, at the Spine Institute of San Diego. I'm here with Dr. Stephen Darrington, who is a pain specialist, board certified in both pain and physical medicine and rehabilitation and advanced training in regenerative medicine. That's the field of medicine that involves things like PRP, stem cells, et cetera, uh, and things that a lot of people have been asking me about. So let me just start out by kind of putting together the picture of this problem because this is an immense problem. People that have low back pain at some point in their lives, um, this is such a common scenario that it has gotten to be, like from a social standpoint, significant in terms of our productivity, quality of life, uh, et cetera. Because at some point, nearly all adults will have a significant episode of back pain. For most of us, it will be self-limited, but for many of us, it will just smolder along uh, in waxing and waning kind of uh, uh, back and forth kind of pictures, intermittent pain, um, and will just continue to kind of affect, it won't debilitate you, but it'll affect your work, it may affect your relationships, etc. cetera. Uh, luckily, most people, that episode of back pain resolves in six weeks, but 7% of those become chronic. So seven doesn't seem like a very big number, but if you start out with 75% of all adults in America, 7% being chronic, that is a staggering number. And obviously that leads to lots of medical office visits. It's the number one cause of work-related disability and the costs associated with it. Think about that, the number one cause of work problems. So this is a problem that um, is prevalent and we need to kind of address it. And I wanna show you something that uh, paints why we're having this problem. So let's start out by asking the question, where does this nagging back pain come from? So if you're like a medicine doctor and you're starting to look at medical reasons for this back pain, look at this huge, big blue area that constitutes the majority of the causes of back pain. You know what that area is? Non-specific low back pain. So if you're a doctor, okay, you're kind of, you can deal with cancer and all these other things. They have very specific diagnoses for which they have very specific treatments. But the vast majority of people that show up to your office has non-specific low back pain. And when you have an entity that's called non-specific low back pain, it's really hard to go about treating it. And so what's happened is a large proportion of our population are being neglected in terms of treatment because we don't know exactly how to deal with it for a variety of reasons. Uh, and this is one of them. So if you would delve a little bit more, what could be the cause of non-specific back pain? It's not that much better. It could be due to a variety of anatomic locations, right? Or conditions. 
probably the biggest one is the disc. The shock absorbing disc starts losing its shock absor absorbing function. And now it's like having a car without shock absorbers. It's gonna cause a lot more stress to go through the bones and the discs and it's gonna cause pain. The ligaments can also cause pain, especially if they're under stress or they're injured. Same thing with the bones and the tendons, as well as all the muscles that are basically designed to keep you upright when it comes to the spine. So you can just see when it comes to nonspecific back pain, it can be due to a variety of things. So it begs the question, how do you go about treating a problem like this? So here's what kind of traditional medicine is all about. And this is probably what most of you that are attending this have already gone through. There's the medical management, that is medicines, pain medications, activity modification, lifestyle changes, hopefully physical therapy, exercise, diet, sleep, stress management. These are all the things that we uh, start with to try to deal with this back pain. And fortunately for many of us, that is enough. But for many of us, that is only partially effective. You still have pain to the point where you're just kind of a crank. You're miserable, you're unhappy, you have a hard time concentrating at work, and you're just not functioning at your optimal self. And if you told me I was living a life like that, I'd be devastated. I suspect most of you are too. So the next kind of level of care is what we call pain management. And Dr. Darrington is a pain specialist. And this is traditionally pain medications and steroid injections. Um, and I think most of us have gone through that. That is also highly effective, but again, it doesn't treat everybody. So there's a group of patients that despite good medical management, despite good pain management, they still have problems. And now they're considering surgery. That's where I come in. And when you start looking at surgery, most patients see that S word and they are petrified, especially when it involves the F word, fusion because that is the traditional surgery for discogenic low back pain, for example. And fusion surgery is a big deal. And if you need fusion surgery, and that's really the last or the least worst option after trying everything, it's a great operation, but it is like driving 100 on the freeway. If something bad happens, it's, it's terrible. And I think most people are afraid of fusion surgery because they hear from the people that aren't doing well. Fusion surgery patients that are doing well, they forget they had surgery and they don't complain about it. But that group of patients that don't, they're miserable and they like, they tell everybody. So we think all fusion surgery doesn't work. Irrespective, fusion surgery is a big surgery and we're always trying to um, avoid fusion surgery. So what else is there in a person like this? So this is the, this is the example of the patient that I'm talking about that's gone on and we don't really have a place to put them. They're busy, they're working, they're basically like us. You don't, you don't have time to take off work for six months to take care of this. They've had this pain for a while, it's just lingering. Sometimes it's off and on, it's not constant, but when it does come on, it's weeks of misery. And they've done everything, they've modified their workstation, they've uh, avoided painful activities, they've tried all the traditional non-operative treatments like physical therapy, chiropractic care, acupuncture, et cetera. And they're still not better, but clearly they're not willing to have a fusion because maybe they're not bad enough to warrant a surgery of that magnitude, or most commonly it's, they're bad enough, but they've been holding off for a year. And right now is a terrible time to take off work for six months to have a big surgery because that could devastate your kind of career track. I know if I took six months off work, my, my practice would be totally different and it would take me years to get it back on track. So I get it. So that's why Dr. Darrington is here because this group of patients is abundant there. I suspect many of us have this exact scenario or know many people with this exact scenario. So we have to ask, all right, we can't just stop there. What else is there? And I would say that what we didn't add to that list of traditional treatments is regenerative medicine. That includes things that are relatively new um, and kind of exciting because it's much more thoughtful, much more biologic, um, but it's new, so we don't know much about it. So I'd like to start off by asking the first question to Dr. Darrington, I suspect many of you already have this, and that's about PRP, because um, uh, I get a lot of patients asking me about that. I know it works really well in the orthopedic field, but what is PRP and does it work for back pain? So with that, 
Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Darrington uh, his thoughts on this and hand, over, hand everything over to Dr. Darrington. Excellent. Well, um, thanks, Dr. Kim. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Um, that's a really good overview. And like you said, unfortunately, this is something that for most people is not something that's chronic for them, but for the people that it is, it completely changes their lives. And we, we see this every day, unfortunately, the people that, that uh, you know, don't recover and have tried all kinds of things and they're just pulling their hair out going, I wanna, I wanna be able to you know, pick up my kids. Sometimes I wanna go back and be able to even walk or run again. Um, and their options are limited. And, and um, you know, a lot of times we're just kind of temporizing symptoms. So um, you know, there's gotta be better options. And I, th I think we're at the point where we're finding some new options that can really be effective. And um, you know, I know you're a big proponent of having research and having data, which is really how we get a better understanding scientifically of what actually is helpful, not just going off of anecdotal stories. So having some of those numbers are really important on top of you know, having you know, people that, that individually say they did great with treatment X, Y, or Z. Uh, but, but PRP, um, you know, that's a word that gets, gets thrown around a lot. Uh, it stands for platelet-rich plasma. So what we're basically doing when you make something like PRP and use it for something orthopedic or in the spine is you're spinning really, really fast the blood down to separate out the different parts of the blood and you're isolating the platelets, which are kind of like our first responders, like the EMS system for our body. And our body uses the platelets and the growth factors inside the platelets for repair all the time. Anytime you skin your knee or you cut something or you pull a muscle, you, you get bleeding and those platelets see what's wrong and they get activated and they start he healing that, that process, whatever, whatever the injury was. And they do things locally. And they also even send those signals from far away to help those things to heal. Um, so, P so platelets are one of the types of cells that we have in our blood. So in our blood, we have red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and a bunch of other things. But it's basically a type of cell within our blood that you isolate from a patient, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and the platelets are really, like I said, they're the ones that kind of do a lot of the repair work. Red blood cells carry oxygen around our body, white blood cells fight infections, and, and platelets are the ones that kind of get, get a lot of the work done. Um, so when you're making PRP, it's important to one, be able to concentrate the platelets enough to where you can actually have a therapeutic benefit. Um, and and there's, there's dozens, if not more, different kits that will make PRP that are commercially available that you might see in your local doctor's office. Um, and some of them do a pretty good job of concentrating the platelets. Some don't do a very good job. There's some papers that come out just in the last year or two that showed basically that PRP didn't work. I think it was, I think it was for knee arthritis. And when you look a little closer at the details of the paper, uh, they only concentrated the PRP 1.2 times above baseline. So they basically didn't even concentrate the platelets at all. Um, another thing is being able to separate out the red cells and the white cells. There's, there's some times where having some white cells may be helpful, but most of the time you want to keep that out of your concentrated platelet mixture. Uh, so and again, what's the key for a patient to ask their provider if they're planning to do PRP? I, I they think ask the, them how they you want to ask them how PRP, they process right? it and, and see if they can give you any kind of information as far as what their platelet concentration is. Is it leukocyte rich? Is it leukocyte poor? Um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've got, a, I've got a, a staff person who does my lab processing, so I'm not using any kits. So I can, I can adjust the concentration of my platelets uh, depending on what areas I'm treating. If I'm injecting inside of a joint or a tendon or a ligament, or especially if I'm doing something closer to the nerves or the disc, like an epidural injection, we're making different versions of PRP at different concentrations. Um, so for me, having that flexibility, it gives me a lot more control over exactly what and where I'm injecting. Um, but really they should, even just a basic you know, PRP injection into a joint, you should be having as high of a concentration as possible just to give you as much of those, those growth factor signals to, to try to initiate as much of a repair process as possible. Um, so, so as far as how PRP can help back pain, um, you know, there's, there's a handful of studies that are out there. I want to just kind of touch on a little bit of uh, a couple of what those show. Um, so I've got a couple slides here. And um, I didn't realize this until I talked to Dr. Darrington, but there's two applications of PRP, one inside the disc for discogenic pain and one in the 
outside the disc, but next to the nerve. We call that the epidural space. Yeah. To deal with like nerve symptoms like radiculitis, sciatica, and things like that, right? Right. So, so as, as you were touching on earlier, Dr. Kim, um, you know, back pain is very, very common. Disc pain is probably one of the most common causes, at least initially. And then after that, as you get some, some mechanical changes over time, then the facets become more problematic and you get this whole constellation of, of several things that are, that are really driving what the pain uh, sources are. Uh, but there's, there's two main parts to the disc. There's the inside part, uh, it's kind of like a jelly donut. And if you look down here at the bottom, that's what this part is here. The outside part is called the annulus. And what oftentimes happens at some point when we're younger, that could be 20s, 30s, 40s, oftentimes you'll tear that outside part. And that allows some of this inside part to squeeze out and that could irritate one of the nerves. That's where you get things like sciatica and radiculopathy and pinched nerve kind of feelings. Sometimes that tear itself can be painful. Here's an MRI showing a bright white spot where that outside part is torn. Um, now that may or may not be painful for the patient. That's one of the things that's kind of interesting when you look at, at uh, you know, real life patients, but also look at research data. These things can be present in someone without any pain, uh, but they're oftentimes a source of low back pain. Um, I have a lot of patients with that problem. Yeah. We call and that an annular tear, Yep. but uh, they can cause sing a significant pain. Yep. And like you said, there's, there's kind of a couple different places we could inject PRP. Um, one of them is, uh, well, you kind of touched about this a little bit, but we're going to focus on the orthobiologics versus the regular corticosteroid injections for, um, you know, for radicular pain, for pinched nerve pain, for coming from nerve irritation. Um, and we'll just kind of so do this is like an here. epidural steroid injection that you do with steroids. Exactly. But instead yeah. of steroids, you would use PRP. Right. So one of the things that I always tell patients is that epidural is a location. It's not what's being injected. 99% of the time when someone gets an epidural injection, if it's for pain purposes, it's with, with the steroid or with cortisone. Um, obviously, if someone's pregnant and about to deliver, they do just lots of numbing medicine. Uh, here, we're using a special version of PRP called platelet lysate. Uh, and this is a comparison that we did looking at the traditional epidural steroid injection compared to the platelet lysate. And you can see two different groups of people and the patients that um, had the platelet lysate injections received fewer injections. And these people that were in two groups could switch to the other group. They didn't know which group they were starting in or going to, but 11 of the 85 patients switched groups at about two months. None of the epidural, or no, sorry, none of the platelet lysate epidural injection patients switched. And part of the reason, presumably, is that their function got better and their pain got better. Right. This is looking at a pretty standard functional uh, test that you people fill out questions and you want to get nine for this to be statistically significant and, and minimally clinically significant at three months the change in that functional rating index score on average was almost 10 for the platelet lysate injection and was barely two for the steroid injection and if you look at six months you see that barely two is is really down under one now and you're still having lasting benefits here so Injecting outside of the disc close to the nerve can really help with that uh, radicular pain. And this so is- So it has a greater effect and it lasts longer, it looks like. Exactly, yeah. That's and really promising data. I wasn't yeah. aware that there was this such is, a- This is a, a study that uh, a group that I'm affiliated with, Regenex, uh, put out looking at our registry data. Um, I think it was almost 500 patients that were followed for, as you see, 24 months. So two full years. And this is the, the amount of patients that felt better at all these different time points. So we're at you know 70 plus percent feeling better, some feeling no change, and almost you know very very small amount feeling worse. And if you look at that same functional rating index, you can see that improvement actually climbing over time. Where with a steroid injection, you might get that initially in the first month or two, but usually by month three or four, a lot of people are are starting to have the right. effect wear off. So this is not a temporary thing. This is something that can last much longer. Uh, and if you look at the pain score changes compared to baseline, you can see these, uh, you know, the pain numbers uh, continuing to, to change greater. Uh, and that, those dots mean it's statistically significant. So based on their starting points, this is a difference in, uh, in how their pain is. So this is a really good option for patients that, um, you know, are dealing with more the nerve kind of feeling, which oftentimes comes from the disc, 
Uh, and this is something that I'm sure Dr. Kim, you send patients all the time to get epidural steroid injections to try to almost buy them some time before you know they 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 kind of decide to go towards the towards the fusion or some other kind of surgery. Um, but this is something that can really buy them a lot more time and, and sometimes can actually resolve the issue. Um, so this look, this is a group of patients that have both back pain and sciatica or radiculopathy type pain, nerve pain going down their leg. Yeah, not just pure back pain. Correct. Yeah, these are ones that have leg pain and plus or minus back pain. Um, now, this is a really impressive MRI. This doesn't happen all the time, but this is a case of a patient that um, in June had a, had a platelet lysate epidural injection. This big bulb right here, that's their disc that's squeezing out. And if you look down here, there's really no room for the nerves in the middle of the spine. By November, that bulge had resolved. And you can see all these little dots here. Those are the nerves that now have room. Now you could obviously say maybe it's just a matter of time because as we know, herniations can resolve and especially large ones have a tendency to resolve uh, better than small bulges. Uh, but this is a person who had a year and a half history of this. Now the likelihood oh, of wow. that getting magically better after a year and a half of it being there just with an additional five months of time, not very likely. Let me say something about that. That's really promising because um... I just want to remind everybody what platelets do. So platelets are the cells that migrate to an injured area. And the first thing it does is it, it stops the bleeding because platelets start clot, the clotting cascade, for example. So you have an injury in a part of the body, it's bleeding, platelets go there, they deposit there, they stop the bleeding, and then it releases all these growth factors that initiate the healing response. So if you put it into that context, it makes perfect sense that that something like PRP will contribute to the resorption of a big disc herniation because you're now concentrating kind of in an artificial way, all the growth factors, all the physiology that would go toward wanting to do that by itself if we didn't do anything. And now you're just concentrating it there. Yeah. And, and one, of the makes things a lot of sense. one of the things I think is really important to point out, you know, these are very precise fluoroscopic guided injections into this epidural space, which is really a matter of, I just did a bunch of these earlier today. It's a matter of millimeter differences from being in that space and not being in that space. So if you're not using image guidance and you're not skilled with how to do these injections, you're not getting things where you think you are. Uh, I see patients, I don't know how often you see these patients in your office, but I've seen patients that have had injections using PRP and other kinds of similar regenerative things in, a, in an office where someone who's not using fluoroscopic guidance or x-ray guidance, maybe they're using ultrasound, but a lot of times they're doing more, I mean, I'm not sure what they're calling their injections, but it's really you know, paraspinal muscle injections. You're kind of getting in that general area, um, but you're not getting targeted injections like I'm showing here. So there can be a wide variety in what someone is offering when they are saying, oh, we do PRP for, for low back pain. Um, so, um, you need to make sure that you're asking some questions before you just say, hey, this sounds great. I heard about it and, and this, should, this should be the same thing as what he's talking about. This is really fantastic. We have a raised hand sure. um, from a physician that I know. So we're gonna bring him up if he wants to ask the question live, but keep going, Dr. Darrington. This is fantastic information. Who's muted? Okay. Um, Dr. Emger, if you got a question, I'll, I'll wait a second. Otherwise, um, we'll switch. I think we should keep going until we can call up Dr. Emder. Okay. Uh, and we'll tee him up and then we'll interrupt you. So sure. So in the of time, let's keep going. So the next, uh, the next kind of step, um, and this is more for the back pain itself that classically is worse when you sit, when you bend, when you sneeze, when you cough. This is treating that annular tear that causes you know, chronic low back pain that's worse with those kind of positions. And there's a couple main orthobiologic things that you can inject. We talked about PRP, but there's also bone marrow stem cells. Um, now this x-ray here is an is a x-ray that I took using that fluoroscope as I was confirming needle placement into torn discs for this gentleman. 
Uh, I think this actually, this is a former NFL guy that I've treated in the past that used to get epidural steroid injections pretty much every off season because his back would just bug him. He'd actually have to dedicate a week of every, uh, a day of every week to do basically doing back rehab just so he could get back on the field. Um, so this is kind of what those injections look like on the imaging. Over here, you'll see me holding some of the concentrated bone marrow. Here's what PRP looks like or a good version of PRP looks like. This is just some of the plasma from the blood. So even a little bit lighter, but PRP really should be almost in all the cases should be this color, if not lighter, um, because that means that you're separating out the red blood cells and you're, and you're losing some of that potential pro-inflammatory in a non-positive uh, way uh, from any kind of you know, regenerative treatment that you're offering. We should point out too and make it clear, Dr. Darrington is talking about two different things, I think. Yeah. Platelet PRP, which is a subcomponent of the cells from your blood. Yeah. And bone marrow aspirate, which is the blood that you get from your bone marrow when you stick a needle inside the bone. And it's filled with um, what we call uh, primordial cells, yeah. many of which are stem cells capable of becoming any cell that you want. So. You know, stem cells are designed to kind of regenerate, recreate normal tissue from scratch. PRP, correct me if I'm wrong, is designed to kind of unleash the body's healing potential and all the growth factors that it has to kind of help the body heal, um, go through a healing process. Yeah, so they, they do kind of work a little bit differently, um, but I'll show you in just a second here. Um, you know, PRP is actually pretty capable of doing repair. Um, there's some uh, images of annular tears, some of those disc tears that can be really painful, uh, actually healing with, uh, with injecting PRP directly into that disc. Now, like I was saying before, the, the epidural injection needs to be done with image guidance. The intradiscal injection absolutely needs to be done with image guidance. Uh, and it takes a long time to be able to get the skills to be able to do those injections. Um, but there's, there's actually, this is a, there's a three year update now, but this is two years update following patients with discogenic pain. So that sitting intolerance, bending, twisting, sneezing, coughing pain, that's right in the middle of your back, uh, injecting PRP into those painful discs. Now this is looking at those patients over 24 months after their injections. This is a, a pain rating scale, and you can see the change and that drop in their pain over those two years. The functional rating index, which a good number is gonna be going down. And then the, uh, there's a couple different functional questionnaires where these numbers wanna be going up. So you can see how these are diverging from before treatment to after treatment, very significant changes lasting 24 months. I've seen the three year update on this data and it, and it holds true just the same. I mean, this data seems really uh, compelling. Why is it that, um, maybe it's just me, but why is it somebody like me, we don't think about PRP that much when it comes to these patients. Um, well, I, I, I think to pay attention to the literature more and have more of these webinars and have people yeah, like it, you more. It's, so it's hard to keep up. I mean, I, I go many I go of my several, colleagues and I go to several conferences. Their doctors are like me. Yeah, I, I go to several conferences a year that focus really exclusively on regenerative medicine. And it's amazing how much new stuff is coming out every year with with physicians that are doing some really amazing stuff. Um, so being aware of kind of what's coming out and really what's changing even in the last couple of years. Uh, is, is pretty exciting. Um, but, you know, there's only so many people that are skilled with not only the techniques, but also the understanding with regenerative medicine on how to choose which treatment for what problem, where to put it. And again, having the skills to be able to inject it there. Um, so all those letters at the end of your name, actually, are, it's like for advanced training, specifically for regenerative medicine. It's like yeah. a, well, the, you really yeah. need so to know some specific information. You need to uh, gear yourself up with the technical know-how to make this work. It's not yeah. just something that you can buy off a shelf and start doing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there, there's that two main sense. organizations that I, that I think are important to bring up. If you're looking at someone who does these injections, they should be working very closely with you know, really either the Interventional Orthobiologic Foundation uh, or um, the 
the, uh, the Ortho Biologic Foundation. So Toby or IOF. Uh, I actually teach for the IOF. Uh, I, I, I teach these, these uh, cadaver courses on injections uh, as well as the mindset behind how to use them. And these are both great um, organizations that have some really, really top-notch people from around the world involved with them. And they're what's helping this field to advance forward uh, and really trying to make sure that we bring everybody along with us and, and try to not have as much of the, like I was saying, the basically palpation, non-image guided, you know, treatments that I think are not much more than sham, honestly, even if you're using the best stuff, if you're not injecting it where it needs to go, um, you know, you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have the same kind of outcomes. Um, and and, uh, and that, um, I'm not familiar with those specific organizations, but why don't, um, we'll put into the chat yeah. the links to those organizations so, so people can kind of at least go there. You have another source of information about this stuff. Perfect. I have a bunch of questions. Sure. That I just want to rattle off, but I don't want to do that until you feel like you're kind of at a stopping point. Let me, yeah, well, I'll just highlight a couple more. So I, I kind of skipped ahead. This is just a couple more of the data points for that study showing that these numbers just continue to get better. And here's some before and after images for these intradiscal treatments. Now you can see here that bright white, that's a tear that's right there that bright white over time goes away. A pretty big bulge that herniation is... here over time goes away. So these are some impressive pictures looking afterwards um, and seeing how these can really change. Uh, so yeah, I'm happy to answer some questions here because I'm gonna okay, kind of switch. Are up questions that people are asking about PRP. Um, PRP for SI joint pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PRP works pretty well for SI joint pain. Um, a couple things to keep in mind. One, you got to make sure that that is the pain source. Um, there's lots of physical exam maneuvers that can be done to identify that. Um, even if you do five or six of them, they're still only so uh, accurate. Um, so the, the gold standard still is to do basically a numbing injection into the joint to see if that takes away the pain. If it is, it, it works really well. Um, now you can't ignore the ligaments that are overlying that joint as well. So every time I'm treating the SI joint, I'm treating the, the, the whole stretch of ligaments across that joint. Uh, cause that's I very, very important. You said that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen, it, it's amazing how much different when you're thinking about, um, I call it fancy duct tape. This is stuff that holds things together. And, you know, SI joints don't move very much, but they do move. And if you're not addressing some of that, you know, duct tape structural component on top of what's happening inside the joint, you're, you're, leaving, you're leaving a lot of benefit on the table. Um, now I'll say a lot of times too, I've had several patients come to me and say, it's my SI joint, it's my SI joint, it's my SI joint. You gotta make sure that someone's really evaluating your low back too, because that's kind of a, of a no man's land where things can get kind of murky and it can be challenging to figure out what's coming from where and in what combination. So- um, You know what, I think we should have another webinar later did on the SI joint because I'm in the same situation. I have a lot of people asking me about the SI joint and mm -hmm. and, it's a lot more than just a joint problem. Now there's PRP, probably stem cells uh, injections, and there's even a minimal invasive surgery for it. So um, hopefully the person that asked that question can wait for our next webinar because this is a really important topic that is not gonna be enough just for a quick yeah. answer. But it sounds like if you can confirm the SI joint is a pain generator, PRP is a very good option. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a bunch more. Okay. What are the risks of PRP and is it okay for somebody 75 plus or older? Yeah, so the risks from PRP itself uh, is, is essentially none. I mean, this is all coming from your own body. Uh, so we call this autologous. So basically it's a blood draw, just like you get any kind of lab work done or donate any blood. And then it's minimally processed. It's really just spun down and concentrated and isolated. So there's nothing foreign in there. There's nothing that, at least that I add to my PRP, um, you know, to make it where your body might have some reaction to it. Um, depending on where you're injecting, there are risks with any, any injection, any procedure, um, but with appropriate image guidance and, and training, um, you know, it's a very safe procedure. And, and I, I treat patients 
I, I've got a handful of mid 90 year old patients that I treat and they can still do very well. So there's really no upper age limit. Uh, as long as you don't have some, you know, some blood problem where your platelets aren't working right, uh, there's a good chance that PRP, depending on your specific issue, uh, could be an option. Okay, we have some interesting questions. These are two totally unrelated questions, but I just want to ask them at the same time. Okay. One, does PRP help arachnoiditis? Maybe you can just say a few things about what arachnoiditis is. And can you use PRP if the patient's on blood thinners? Do they have to go off blood thinners before their PRP is obtained from their blood? Yeah, so depending on, I'll answer the second one first. Depending on where you're injecting, the risk, the procedure itself may carry some bleeding risk. So you may have to or may be requested to, to stop or hold temporarily a blood thinning medication to reduce any chance of excessive bleeding from the procedure itself. Um, some of those blood thinning medicines directly work on the platelets. Uh, and we want your platelets to be able to be activated and to be able to do what we're trying to have them do. So if you're taking a medicine that actually uh, blocks the action of the platelets, then like you're, probably gonna, you're probably going to have a suboptimal outcome. Um, I'm not too familiar with, with uh, any, any research on arachnoiditis and PRP. Um, I actually just injected a patient who was diagnosed with arachnoiditis years ago. She had had uh, multi-level laminectomy. She had a fusion. She was in a car accident. I think the fusion hardware broke, at least some of it did. She still has one screw in her back, but the other ones are gone. Uh, and she's continuing to have leg pain from presumably her low back nerves uh, with a normal EMG. So her nerve study test was normal. Uh, updated MRI, you're not seeing any kind of significant stenosis, no obvious reasons or explanations for the ongoing leg symptoms, um, but they're still there. Um, and I, I see this, uh, I see this every once in a while where patients have, you know, arachnoiditis usually doesn't come, um, you know, from nowhere. Oftentimes I, I see it at least post-surgically um, and it, it can be more challenging to treat for sure. I've treated a few patients. I'll say that the success rate is not as good as what is it normally is for the platelet lysate that I see. Um, but I've had some patients that, that do get improvement with it. And that's huge because uh, arachnoiditis is one of those entities that uh, traditionally has been very difficult to treat. And I would say in some ways we do not have a treatment for it. If it's true arachnoiditis where um, the nerves that are supposed to be floating in this cerebral spinal fluid that prevents anything from sticking together no longer works like that. And all the nerves are so inflamed that they're clumping together inside the uh, inside the fecal sac where, where it floats around in the spinal fluid. So do you do your injections intrathecally inside the spinal fluid or epidural next to the nerve? Epidurally, I'd, I'd rather be in that vicinity, especially as we're kind of getting into that kind of an injection. You want to be cautious because you, you mean, you just, we're just trying to, we, you know, we're trying to, to get as much benefit as possible and not have any potential uh, you know, negative outcome here. So we're being cautious, uh, at least initially with those kind of injections. Um, because like I said, I've, I've seen some of those patients do well um, with just doing epidural injections. Wow, that, uh, this is a lot further along than I thought. Um, so I'm glad we're having this webinar. Two things. One, I see we have exactly 100 participants. So Apologies to the 101 and 102 and 103. Um, you guys hopefully will be able to watch it on YouTube and Facebook because we're recording it. Um, so for the new attendees, just want to remind you to look at the bottom, click on the chat button and use the chat feature to communicate with us and ask questions because we have Lana sitting right here, checking that uh, and interrupting us, uh, answering some questions directly that are straightforward. Uh, so use that chat feature to interact with us. And then I just, did you want to talk about something else? Because I still have more questions, but if you wanted to uh, I mean, talk more about something else, so I want the, you to get to that The first. next thing I was going to talk about, and we can, we can, uh, we can kind of just breeze through that real fast because it's really similar application into the disc, but using bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Um, so I would like to hear about that. Yeah. So let's get a couple of minutes and then we can answer lots of questions. I love it. Let's do that. The reason why this part is interesting is because one of the problems with a disc that is starting to wear out is that the cells inside the disc are starting to die for a variety of reasons. One of which is that it does not get enough nutrients just because of the way the disc is made. There's no blood vessels that go inside the disc. So 
all the nutrients and all the waste products that a disc cell is going to make occurs in one lifetime inside the disc without any kind of replenishing of, in, uh, of any magnitude. So if you have a disc where the cells are dying off and it's choked of its nutrients, it makes sense to inject something in there that will help the cells grow more or even inject cells to replace the dead cells. Yeah. And that's why there's been a lot of interest in disc regeneration and injecting what we call stem cells into the disc to try to help the existing cells be less sick and hopefully have new cells populate the disc and become the new occupants. I mean, that's a gross oversimplification, I'm sure, but um, uh, that's why this field is so interesting. Yeah, and yeah. one of the things that you said is so tough is that that intradiscal environment is is a pretty hostile environment. It it does it's not it's it's hard. So you've got to, yeah, it, it it's just a it's a challenging area to treat, especially as the disc gets more worn down. Uh, I, I want to clarify with I think both of these actually this one is a little this one is a little more inclusive. This study here looking at bone marrow concentrate actually with some degenerative disc disease. So the, the first study with PRP was looking more at the annular tears, basically the kind of the early injury process in the disc before it's gotten more worn down and the disc has gotten dark and the height of the disc has, has lessened. Um, but this is a study uh, showing three-year follow-up. It looks like I cut off the rest of my uh, data here. Um, but this is showing pain scores and another functional score baseline to afterwards, and you can see these dots here again, that means it's a significant decrease in the pain and improvement in function over time uh, after these uh, injections. And this is one, Dr. Kim, I think you'd be interested to see, you were just kind of commenting on it, but here's colony forming unit fibroblast concentration, which is a way to measure the true mesenchymal stem cells present in the bone marrow after you withdraw it, concentrate it, and then they count it. So with this study, they, they put some of it into the disc and they took one cc and they sent it to lab for testing. And what they saw, you can see that the functional changes improved and the pain improved, but there was even a difference between them depending on if you had more or less stem cells in that bone marrow concentrate. Um, so, and, and another thing with this study, I think there was only, there's, this is a pretty small study, 26 patients um, followed over this three years, 20 of them, they got a follow-up MRI. I believe that was at two years and eight of the 20 actually showed improvement in the Furman scores, uh, which is basically the brightness and the degenerative amount uh, of, of changes seen in the disc itself. So I don't remember how many grades it is, but there's at least some brightening and kind of some rejuvenation of the disc. Uh, to go along with the functional and the pain changes. Wow, that's exciting. And, and this is looking out over this whole 36 months. These are all patients that were basically ready for a one or two level fusion, and they were looking for an alternative. Uh, you can see even after three years, only 30% of them had gone on to fusion. So a, a high percent of patients that for this duration of time and presumably longer because there you see their pain and their functional scores. Um, you know, for those that responded, they had a lot of benefit. So presuming that all those patients were in enough pain that they're seriously considering a fusion, seven out of 10, 70% of them got better to the point where they did not have a fusion. Correct. 30% still had pain and they decided to go to a fusion. This is what right. this is showing, right? Yeah, and actually that 30% is of the single level patients. For all of them, it was eight out of 10 did not have fusion. Um, I mean, here's just a quick video of uh, one of my guys that I treated. Pretty athletic guy before, but his back used to slow him down quite a bit. And he's almost, he's actually, I think he's probably over two years out now. And he's, he's jumping like a frog. <laughs> well, I'm glad you showed that video because um, as a spine surgeon, we're, we don't see a patient like that and go, we got to get a patient being able to do that again. We, yeah. When it comes to spine surgery, we, we're trying to take somebody that is really debilitated and getting them back to like activities, activities of daily living. It's not commonplace that we're looking at somebody to try to get them to that level of function. Yeah. But, you know, in my practice, I have a lot of professional athletes and a lot of people that are very 
devoted to their extracurricular sport. Yeah. And if you tell them you can't do that anymore, they're, they would be devastated. I'd be yeah. one of those people. So um, traditionally as spine surgeons, we've just ignored the patients that want these little incremental improvements to, to gain a very high level of function. And yeah. we've been mostly focusing on huge problems with huge effects. And um, we really don't want to see somebody unless they're like, you know, dragging their leg in here. And I right. think that has led us to kind of ignore the majority of the patients that have spine problems that go from being able to do an activity like that very high level activity to the, to one where they can't even, you know, jog. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, and yeah. And the, because we think if you can jog, you're fine. But if somebody says, well, I want to jump over like whatever the high, high that was. Yeah. I'm pretty impressed by the way. We usually just go, well, that's, you know, we're not here to make you Superman. Right. But yeah. I don't think that's right thinking. If we have the ability to get people like that without doing dangerous major surgery, um, I think there's a very large number of patients out there that want to get there. So um, I'm really glad we're having this talk. Perfect. So I'm going to open up just a, a can of worms here that we'll have to dive into in another uh, call. But you were kind of talking at the beginning about um, all the different possible, you know, places where pain could be coming from, especially in that non-specific where you go, is it the disc? Is it the facet? Or is it the ligaments? What can we treat? How do we kind of pick it? Uh, and a lot of times, especially over time, this ends up being a multifactorial problem. Uh, even if it was, say, initially a disc injury, you know, the facet joints begin to get worn down and the ligaments get a little bit lax and they can get stretched out. I love that you had the iliolumbar ligament on one of the uh, as one of the, the pictures earlier there, because that's a very, very common one that I see and treat all the time. But just understanding just kind of in basic that this whole we call functional spinal unit has all these different components to it. And when one of them is not working right, the other ones are going to be affected in one way or the other, whether they're symptomatic or whether they're getting worn down, and, but you're not even feeling it until, you know, something else happens. Um, but we're trying to preserve as much as possible the biomechanics and the normal motion and normal function of the spine when I'm approaching it from, from my injections. Um, and, and that I think is one thing that can, um, you know, give people much more longer lasting changes compared to, you know, just doing epidural injections and calming the nerve down, but not really doing anything to stabilize the rest of the spine and taking some pressure off of the facets or, you know, whatever else is, is getting, uh, is getting uh, you know, irritated in the background. Yeah, I think that's what's so great about the field of restorative medicine, because traditionally surgery and pain management, it's almost like we're taking care of things after the disaster has already happened. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're also trying to intervene a little bit earlier, trying to intervene in a way that involves regeneration rather than blocking something or altering something. Because surgery is a, is an altering event you're yeah. taking something and changing it completely uh, into something else uh, and that's probably why it can be dangerous all right i have more questions a bunch Let's you go. ready yeah um these are two different questions but i want to ask it all at the same time is prp useful for ankylosing spondylitis and for foot drop so ankylosing spondylitis i i don't think it would be that helpful for i've never treated anyone with it uh, it's a completely different pathology, um, and I don't, I don't think that the platelets would, would do much, even I'm not sure the stem cells would do much to really alleviate that problem, unfortunately. Um, for foot drop, uh, yes, definitely could be an option. Um, I always want to see the EMG, especially before treating. That, that's that nerve study test I mentioned before, uh, because if you've got uh, if you've got enough nerve damage, the chance of that nerve waking back up could be very, very low. Um, but I've, I've seen patients who used to have foot drop, maybe, you know, well, if it, there's, there's foot drop and there's just weakness in that foot. So there's a big difference in normal strength, no strength. But uh, I, I've seen that improve. I've got a, 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 a colleague of mine who had a patient who had terrible winging of a scapula. So basically a shoulder blade, the muscles controlling a shoulder blade were so weak from initial spine surgery that he had, then he was involved in another car accident, had another surgery, had lots of the pain down his arm, but also those muscles in his shoulder were so weak that they couldn't even hold his shoulder blade on. Um, this doctor, Dr. Patel, uh, he did 
several different epidural platelet lysate injections into the space around where his, his injury was and eventually started doing injections into the muscles as well because the patient could feel those muscles starting to wake up and the pictures before and after, I don't have it with me right now, but the, the pictures before and after of what his shoulder blade positioning is on his, on his upper quarter uh, and the improved symptoms this patient had were remarkable. Um, now, I don't know how many patients that would walk in with that exact same presentation would get better, but it's definitely a possibility. Now, I think we should remind everybody that PRP, relative to all the other treatments that we employ in the field of spine, is very, very new. There's much more experience in the orthopedic literature, like in the Achilles tendon and tendonitis problems, but in the spine, uh, it's relatively new. Um, but it makes sense. It's it's not just the steroid. It is a like a soup of growth factors that theoretically you could treat facet problems, as well as ligament problems and muscle problems and nerve problems in addition to disc problems. So um, I think this is a really exciting area. Um, Okay, we didn't. We did not talk about lasers. I think that Ugh. the use of lasers is something that I probably use. Do you use lasers in non-surgical applications in your in your office? Or I, I don't. I have some patients who see other practitioners, and a couple that even have their own lasers. Um, but I, I'm not versed enough yet in, in which one to pick and how to use. But but I I think it has an application. But I just I I haven't. Uh, there's lots of other stuff I've been focusing on, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I couldn't answer that too much. Okay, well, let me, uh, let me toot my own horn and talk about lasers a little bit because I do use lasers and I really love that technology. Um, so first of all, um, if you think about it, lasers um, is not just one thing because there's so many different lasers that you can, you can use a laser to cut through steel or you can use lasers to basically um, reshape the cornea of your eyeball. Just think about the, the differences. Like you can't say that about any other instrument, yeah. the breadth and spread of its applications. So it's not surprising that at some point we're gonna start being able to use lasers more and more because we can utilize all the different wavelengths in the entire spectrum of light mm -hmm. uh, and modulate it um, to have different effects. So I suspect in the future, we're gonna find um, lots of different applications. But let me talk to you about the one application that uh, I utilize it for. And if I may, I would like to call up my slides and just get to that slide. Talked about, some, okay, so what about lasers? So let's say you're a patient that has back pain. We figured out it's coming from the disc. It's probably coming from an annular tear like we've seen before. That's this little white spot in the back of the disc. And you can see that this disc is black as well uh, and it's bulging out a little bit. And this patient has tried all the kind of traditional treatments and they've also maybe even have tried PRP and stem cells because not there's no one treatment that is successful in everyone. So we're just going from, it's like a funnel where we're treating people and through the funnel come the people that don't get better and the people that don't get better keep going down the line of treatment. And as you go down the line, the treatments get more and more invasive, I guess, with surgery being more invasive than non-surgery. So we have this patient that is looking at surgery. Most people would basically take, tell that patient the best surgery is either a fusion or a disc replacement surgery. There are both reconstructive surgeries that are big deal surgeries. You're gonna take several months off work. And we know, already know that there are a large group of patients that are kind of miserable, but not so miserable that they would discombobulate their career over it. So is there a way to treat this with a surgery that is really quick? And I would say that there is, and that's the laser endoscopic surgery where we use the operating um, endoscope. So you can make an incision that is like the size of a big pen and through that camera are all these little channels and you look at the screen and do surgery and now you can basically use among other things the laser to remove that annular tear without tearing apart the whole disc because one thing about the laser is that it's really really precise and you can target the laser right at that area and most other instruments you can't do that and i'll give you an example if you use an electrical instrument 
think about it. Electricity will conduct through water. So there are many times where we're trying to use electrical instruments, um, but we are so close to the nerve that the nerve starts jumping uh, and it's too dangerous. So here's a, like a real life example of a patient. There's the annular tear. They've tried everything. We go in there with an endoscope through a little poke hole. We just treat that tear. We don't try to do like a big discectomy. We don't do a displacement or a fusion. Uh, we just remove that abnormality and basically restart a healing process that will hopefully be more normal. And, um, and basically what we're treating is this kind of abnormal reaction that the body makes against the annular tear. And by doing this, by, by the body's abnormal, aberrant effort to protect itself, it develops into chronic pain. We, this happens all the time. Anybody that's had plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, or golfer's elbow will know what that is like, because that's an example of a microscopic injury going down the path of healing, and the inflammatory process just did not turn off, and it just keeps reiterating itself and yep. becomes very painful. And I'm sure anyone that's had those conditions know how painful that condition is. So instead of going in there, making a big incision, causing a lot of damage, um, we have a way to do this through a little poke hole and you can see me operating. Number one, there's like no blood all over the place because usually if you do a regular surgery, there's just blood going everywhere. And two, look where, I'm, where my eyes are. The surgery is done in a manner where I'm looking, at a tel uh, looking up at a, um, at a screen instead of down into the wound. So I'm not opening up the wound in any way for me to look directly. I'm making a little poke hole to pass there's a little tube down with a microscope camera on the end, and thereby I can do the surgery without causing a lot of collateral damage. And those results have been ex uh, excellent in the properly selected patients. So um, uh, that's yet another non-fusion treatment that's really state-of-the-art that's just coming out. So these are all kind of new things that's not part of traditional medicine, but I think it's important because there's a large group of patients that have been that we've not been able to treat without these new kind of state-of-the-art advancements because we have got we right now go from medical management to fusion surgery we have nothing in between and and all this regenerative medicine laser endoscopic surgery uh highly minimal invasive surgery those are all efforts to kind of bridge that gap with that it is exactly five o'clock no it's 503 but if there's any other questions, um, Dr. Darrington, can you stick around for five minutes more? Sure. To yeah, I'm good. More questions? Okay. Um, where's the question that I wanted to ask? And this is the one that I hate addressing because it's, it's difficult. Um, does Medicare cover PRP? Yeah, so I actually answered that uh, just on text uh, over here. I didn't know if we're going to get to it, um, but in in general, Medicare and most private insurers are not covering PRP. Um, there are there's beginning to be some coverage for arthritis in the knee and for tennis elbow by some insurers, depending on the plan. Um, Part of that is that there's there's a lot of research on those areas. Tennis elbow was one of the first areas to have any PRP data on it, uh, probably 20 years ago now. It's not even more. Um, knee arthritis actually has, I believe it's 24 studies now comparing PRP to steroid injections, to hyaluronic acid injections, to even placebo or basically a fake injection. Um, so the data is building on some of those kind of things. There's there's other limitations to why things aren't covered. So it's that's not the only reason. Um, but right now it's not covered. Um, I did share on that uh, comment on the question um, that uh, Regenix has actually uh, developed a, a corporate program where self-insured employers have added Regenix procedures, the kinds of procedures that I do, to their covered policy for their employees. Uh, I believe there's about 8 million uh, employees of those companies. Um, wow. So it's still a small number, but you know, they've seen significant changes in their, um, in their expenses for orthopedic care 
um, by sending their patients to see us instead of getting, you know, knee replacement surgery. That's the biggest thing that I think that they've seen. Um, but across the board, I mean, they, you know, they see a big cost saving difference compared to, um, you know, other procedures that they, that their employees may be looking at, uh, as well as, as you were talking, Dr. Kim, about just some of the downtime and the recovery that it takes from, from some of those more invasive things. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I, I, these questions are always difficult because it has to do with, you know, the way insurance works in our country and um, they are just very slow at adopting new technology, you know, in some ways for good reasons because they want to vet it out, but um, there's some things that they're just way too conservative on and um, there's lots of efforts to try to get these things covered, but it just takes forever. Medicine just moves very slowly. Um, but going back to a question that we can't answer, we do have another question. Can PRP help stenosis? Yeah. This is separate from herniated discs, annular tears, um, yeah. arthritis. Narrowing of the canal where the nerves are basically have a tourniquet around it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it can be helpful. Um, Depends. Well, it sort of depends on the severity, and I'll and I'll I'll be the first to say that when I treat these patients and they get significant symptomatic difference, I'm not making that stenosis go away. It's not going where it's a pinhole and now it's a, you know, it's it's a huge uh, tunnel that you can drive a truck down. Um, but you know, through some of the things that that we treat and we're treating, we talked several times about the ligaments and some of the stability. One of the things I know you see surgically is that ligamentum flavum getting thickened, getting hypertrophied, buckling. Um, when we treat some of the ligaments that are a little bit more on the backside of the spine, not in the canal, they are actually continuous with the ligamentum flavum. That alone can sometimes help take some pressure off of the nerves. Um, and in some cases, we actually directly inject the ligamentum flavum um, through a modified interlaminar approach. If anyone's a, a physician and kind of knows what these injections are, um, and, and that can help in combination with doing the platelet lysate epidural injection to calm the nerves down from the inside, but then also try to remove some of the pressure, um, you know, from the, ex from the, from the outside. Interesting. And then one last question is the less procedure, the laser endoscopic surgery, the same as discectomy surgery. Um, yes and no, it's, um, you can do discectomy surgery with the laser endoscope. And when you do it with the laser endoscope, you're doing the discectomy through just a much smaller skin incision and a smaller surgical corridor, that track of soft tissues, bone, ligaments, everything that's in your way to get to the surgical target site, the disc herniation. So um, the endoscope, the endoscopic technique can be used for the discectomies. And I treat most of my patients that have discectomies endoscopically because it's just less invasive. What we're talking about is treating a group of patients that have things like annular tears, where a discectomy procedure seems like it's too big of a procedure to treat that little thing, even though that little thing is causing a lot of problems. You don't want to do a surgery where by the time you're done, uh, you have more damage from the surgery than you do with what you have left. It would be like killing a fly on the wall with a shotgun. You could su successfully kill the fly, but you end up with a hole in your wall that is probably worse than the fly. So. Um, that's how I look at the difference between the less procedure and the discectomy procedure, depending on the scenario. Um, but again, that, that is a really extended conversation about surgical techniques. And hopefully sometime in the future, we'll have a bunch of surgeons here talking about all the different types of surgeries that we do and why some are better than others. So uh, um, hold that question for another day, but um, that's kind of my take on it. We're totally out of time. I could talk for another hour, but- um, And we're just uh, getting started, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> me too, yeah. Um, but we should stop. Uh, I encourage everybody to um, reach out to us after the fact, hopefully in the chat feature, and maybe we can throw back in there our contact information. So if you have any burning questions, send us an email. I'll try to get to answering you. Um, and hopefully there'll be some other things there. Um, also feel free to share this with your friends. Let them know that uh, we'll post it onto YouTube. And, and both Dr. Darrington and I will post this video uh, onto Facebook. Um, and finally, please send us your comments about what was good about this, what was lacking, and what you would like to see in the future. Um, because uh, 
hopefully once a month I can get together with different types of people and address different questions um, in a group setting like this, because I think there's a lot of questions right now in, in spine, and we didn't even talk about the neck, um, related to our understanding of the disease states and all the new technologies that's coming up uh, that, uh, that are very promising. So uh, thank you, Dr. Darrington. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Kim. Quietly sitting there. <laughs> and thank you to everyone that's attended. We hope this was helpful. And I hope we see everybody next time around. Best wishes, everyone. <laughs>